Senator Coyne. Here. Senator Coleman. Here. Senator Miller. Here. Senator Rogers. Senator Valverde. Here. Madam Chair, there are seven present and one absent. Thank you. Uh, we do have a quorum and the committee is called to order. Um, this evening, we do have uh, four um, items on our agenda. And as has been the practice of this committee in order to efficiently use everyone's time, we are going to um, hear all of the, hear the bills, um, hear from the sponsors of the bills and then move on to public testimony. And in, um, again, in an effort to make our time together more efficient, um, I am uh, going to request a motion to hold uh, the bills before us for further study. This will allow us to take and consider allow both us. the written and verbal testimony we received tonight um, and the, give the bill sponsors the opportunity to uh, address any comments or concerns that are raised at tonight's hearing. So with that being said, I would like to um, entertain a motion to bring forward and hold Senate Bill 357, Senate Bill 472, Senate Bill 474, and Senate Bill 572, a uh, motion to hold for further study by Senator DeMario, seconded by Senator Coleman. And Mr. Clerk, could you please take the roll? Madam Chair. Yes. Senator DeMario. Yes. Senator Archambault. Senator Archambault. Senator Coyne. Yes. Senator Coleman. Yes. Senator Miller. Yes. Senator Rogers. Yes. Senator Valverde. Yes. Madam Chair, there are seven in the affirmative and zero in the negative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And um, we'll now move to um, having the sponsors introduce their bills. And I believe uh, Chairwoman Sosnowski is here with us. And Chairwoman, if you would like to uh, explain Senate Bill 357 for the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this bill. This act would amend the compliance standards for heating oil, bio-based products providing minimum standards for the percentage of bio-based product that certain types of heating oil must contain. This bill would increase the percentage of biodiesel included in heating oil sold in Rhode Island. Page three of the bill details the compliance schedule to increase the percentages. And as we know, biodiesel is a renewable, biodegradable alternative fuel made from a mix of modified vegetable oils and diesel fuel. It's made from yellow grease, which is restaurant uh, used restaurant oil, algae, canola. Um, and as we know, our Rhode Island-based Newport biodiesel produces sustainable biodiesel uh, sourced and produced from waste vegetable oil to fuel diesel engines or home furnaces. And I just really wanted to uh, say one other uh, comment about biodiesel. It reduces emissions, including the amount of soot and air toxins, toxics released into the atmosphere. The EPA research indicates that biodiesel emits 11% less carbon monoxide and 10% less particulate matter than diesel. A study done by the Department of Energy and Agriculture found biodiesel reduces net carbon dioxide emissions by 78%. Unlike petroleum diesel, which contains sulfur and uh, carcinogens, two components that the state emissions boards and EPA regulate, biodiesel is non-toxic and biodegradable. I do understand that DEM has uh, submitted um, some amendments to the legislation, and I'm sure you'll have plenty of comments on the bill. If you, any of the committee members have any questions, I would endeavor to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Sosnowski. Are there any questions for this witness on, on this legislation? Okay, I do not see any, um, and, and Chair, before you move to your um, next bill before us, I did want to recognize that Senator Archambault is here, and so if he can please be recorded as being present and an affirmative on any votes taken. And Thank you, Madam Chair. 
And with that, um, Chair Sosnowski, if you wanted to go ahead and um, explain Bill 472 to the committee. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this act would increase the maximum aggregate amount of community remote net metering systems from 30 megawatts to 90 megawatts and would require the allocation of a minimum of 20% of the generated power to low or moderate income households commencing July 1st, 2021. And projects would be allocated to the programs on a first come, first served basis. Uh, a minimum of one third of the project expansions shall be located on previously disturbed areas, uh, disturbed sites and um, referred to page two of the bill. Also projects um, will be, uh, excuse me, shall be prohibited from co-locating multiple renewable energy resources under common ownership on one or more contiguous parcels unless the total capacity of the co-located projects is less than 10 megawatts in the aggregate. The net metering law uh, that we are amending here was groundbreaking for renewable energy development is now a decade, it's 10 years old. It has made Rhode Island a leader in renewable energy development. The results of this legislation have been highly successful and now 10 years later it needs some adjustments to continue to be successful into the future. I understand there are many, uh, there are several proposed amendments offered, some by PUC, DPUC, and others. Um, and I, I'm glad to see so many folks are interested in, in making numerous comments on the legislation. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to bring this bill forward, and I'm more than willing to answer any questions you may have uh, this evening or in the future after you uh, have the opportunity to listen to uh, listen and read the other comments that are brought forward this evening. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Sosnowski. And are there any questions? Uh, Senator Kalman, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chair Sosnowski, I'm just, I'm curious about the rationale for prohibiting co-location. Um, unless, I understand, unless it's under a certain threshold, but I wonder if you could explain that. Yes, it's been brought to my attention um, over the years that uh, several municipalities have, have found that there is without a prohibition of having adjoining um, projects, there seems to be um, a problem as far as land use development. It's something, it's an issue that I think, uh, I think is more appropriate to be brought up in each community. Um, however, bringing the legislation forward to the General Assembly and new members of uh, the General Assembly, it gives the opportunity to discuss this issue further so other folks can bring in their concerns um, to make this work better uh, in this in this time that we're in, but that's where where that comes from. That people have felt that that it's it's, it's too much development in certain areas, and I think in some areas, when urban areas where you have brownfields, it shouldn't be a problem. But again, we brought that up because that has been a concern over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Chair Sosnowski. Always good to see you back in the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nice to be here. Um, and our next uh, piece of legislation is Senate Bill 474. And Senator DeMario, if you wanted to go ahead and explain. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. So this, um, actually, Chairwoman Sosnowski just uh, sort of set up the premise of this bill um, because the intention of this bill is actually to address the issue that is arising with increased uh, demand for solar um, developments, but also some of the issues that have arisen with using um, green fields and, and clearing forest land to do that. Um, and so what this bill would do is it would allow for um, bigger developments, basically, we can talk about the specifics, but it would allow for larger solar developments in on adjacent parcels to happen as long as they were wholly situated on preferred sites, meaning previously disturbed lands like landfills, gravel pits, um, 
parking lots, things like that. So the Office of Energy Resources had done a study indicating that there are ample preferred sites um, to be used for solar installations over green fields. And so the, the purpose of this legislation would be to incentivize using those um, parcels to be able to, to build larger um, larger solar projects um, versus using uh, green fields or, or forest lands. Um, so if, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. And I know that we have a number of people who are going to give testimony and you have some written testimony on this as well. Thank you, Senator DeMario. Are there any questions for Senator DeMario? Okay. Um, seeing none, uh, the final legislation we have before us tonight is Senate Bill 572. And Senator Coleman, if you wanted to introduce your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is a bill that is intended to start thinking through a framework for regulating geoengineering, which is um, the manipulation of the weather um, and of the environment by, by various means. Um, and so the idea here is to have required geoengineering projects to go through an extensive review process um, and ensure that they would meet health and safety and environmental requirements as evaluated in the public hearing process. Um, it sets up a state fund uh, to sort of collect to collect fees that that come out of the violations here, um, et cetera. The 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 broader context is that you know geoengineering is is a thing. It's a it's an emergent technology. It's happening, um, and it's beginning to happen widely. And um, I I am glad that this bill is held for further study because I think it needs um, it needs a little bit of work. That said, we do need to start considering a framework for how we want to. Um, absorb these technologies, if we want to absorb these technologies, and most importantly, how we protect the well-being of the communities, um, both human and non-human, as they are rolled out. Um, and with that, happy to take questions. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Uh, Senator Miller has a question. I just wondered, is there any of these projects under this definition proposed for Rhode Island? Not currently. Um, which is actually part of why I think now is the appropriate time to have the conversation so so that we're not making a decision sort of under fire of a proposed project. So to my knowledge, there is not, um, which is why I think the framework is beneficial to consider now. Are there any additional questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, we will move to uh, public comment. So the committee knows we have about uh, 22 folks signed up for tonight. And I'm going to ask the uh, members of the public that when they join us that they testify on all of the bills that they're testifying on tonight. And so with that, we should have our first public witness. And I believe we should be joined by uh, Robert Morton. Uh, of Newport Biodiesel and uh, Bob, I, I hear a little bit of noise in the background. If you wanted to uh, turn down, um, turn down the TV, um, there is a little bit of a lag. But you are on live with the committee, and if you want to introduce yourself and let us know, um, let us know what bill you're testifying on, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman, and I want to thank our sponsors that have been with us for a long time on this bill. So. Um, my name is uh, Robert Morton, and I'm chairman of the board of Newport Biodiesel. I testified in favor of the original Biodiesel Heating Oil Act of 2013, which set the blend level for biodiesel and heating oil at 5%. And I'm here again to support changes to the original legislation, which would increase those blends to 50% over the next nine years. Although the original legislation was an important first step toward addressing greenhouse gas reductions, it's certainly not sufficient. A great deal has changed since 2013 and even since last year. We no longer have to debate whether climate change is real. Now is the time to act. The Resilient Rhode Island Act of 2014 established the Executive Climate Change Coordinating Committee, EC4, which has set greenhouse gas reduction objectives for our state that will require significant changes to our energy profile, well beyond what a 5% blend of biodiesel can achieve. Fortunately, we are now in a position to mandate much higher blends of biodiesel and heating oil. Recently, the PUC and the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources conducted a heating sector transformation study. And one of the conclusions of that study stated that the blend requirement for biodiesel could be ratcheted up significantly over time. In line with this possibility, the Northeast heating oil industry 
has recently committed to achieving net zero CO2 emissions by 2050 with interim targets of a 20% biodiesel blend by 2023 and a 50% blend by 2030. The opportunity exists for Rhode Island to be increasing its blending requirements along the lines committed by the delivered fuel industry. Several factors have contributed to make this possible. The first is the Providence Revolution referred to in this report and implemented by the oil heat dealers of New England. They've changed the focus of their industry to address greenhouse gas reductions. The federal programs that support the biodiesel industry have recently been reinstated and upgraded for the next several years. This will allow the biodiesel industry to expand significantly in the near future. State legislatures across the country have developed programs to either incentivize or mandate increased blends of biodiesel in transportation fuels and heating oil. And finally, the development of renewable diesel, a biofuel comparable to biodiesel in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, but free of cold flow disadvantages and completely compatible with petroleum diesel, makes it possible to generate much higher blends with minimal infrastructure modifications. In response to these conditions, the National Biodiesel Board presented a vision for the future that would more than double the volume of biodiesel and renewable diesel produced in the U.S. to over 6 billion gallons per year by 2030. They presented data that indicated there was more than enough feedstock and manufacturing capacity to meet that goal. This is important to the heating oil industry as biodiesel is a drop-in fuel that requires no modifications to the oil heating systems and is here today ready to provide immediate greenhouse gas reduction. As Senator Sazowski stated, every gallon of biodiesel blended with heating oil reduces greenhouse gases by at least 75% relative to petroleum. And biodiesel made from used cooking oil is produced by Newport Biodiesel approaches a 90% reduction. It's important to note that a blend of 17% biodiesel has a lower life cycle carbon footprint than natural gas. This blending of biodiesel into heating oil is a very straightforward process it can readily be accomplished either by the fuel terminals or heating oil distributors. There is clear scientific evidence that greenhouse gas reductions today have a much greater impact on the long-term effects of climate change than reductions that may occur at some time in the future. Therefore, from an environmental point of view, we should move toward higher blends of biodiesel as soon as possible. However, in order to consider the logistic and infrastructure issues that are sure to come with such increases, this bill provides for a stepwise increase in blends that gives terminals and distributors time to make the necessary adjustments. All of these conditions point to the fact that the proposed biodiesel blends can certainly be obtained. I provided in my written testimony a table that shows how much we would save in greenhouse gas reductions over the length of this bill. It would over, by 2030, we would reduce uh, greenhouse gases by more than 1. million metric tons. With a change of administration, the U.S. will certainly be more proactive in addressing the problems of climate change. At every level of government, environmental programs are being initiated. And it's important that Rhode Island continue to lead, and Senate Bill 357 serves that objective. Many other states are working toward higher blends of biodiesel in both transportation fuels and heating oil. Hopefully, Rhode Island can remain as a leader in this effort and work toward meeting the objectives of the EC4 through passage of this legislation. So thank you for the time, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Robert. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I, I don't see any. Thank you so much for sharing um, your um, expertise with us this evening. I know you've been working on this legislation for a long time. Thank you very much. And I believe we should be joined by Roberta Fagan on, with the Energy Marketers Association of Rhode Island. And Roberta, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, you are, and members of this committee. My name is Roberta Fagan, Acting Executive Director of Energy Marketers Association of Rhode Island. I appreciate the opportunity to give a testimony in support of Senate Bill 357, an act relating to health and safety biodiesel products. But first, I would like to thank Senator Sosnowski, 
De Palma, Coyne, Savani, and Lombardo for sponsoring this common sense legislation that is a win-win for everyone. The Biodiesel Home Heating Act is a good bill. Now it's time to make it better, more progressive, relevant piece of legislation, better aligned with Rhode Island's long-term clean energy goals, and that is captured in this amended legislation, S-357, with a scheduled increase from the current 5% biodiesel blend to 10% in 2023, 20% in 2025, and 50% in 2050, and dovetails with the 2021 Act on Climate legislation. It's a tangible, proven solution to the reduction of harmful emissions in the space heating sector. For context, approximately 97% of delivered fuel marketers are multi-generational family-owned businesses, very typically serving their customers' needs for decades. The delivered fuel sector makes up 31% of space heating and serves approximately 129,000 households and businesses here in Rhode Island. Over the last three decades, with the help of the National Oil Heat Research Alliance, National Biodiesel Board, National Energy and Fuels Institute, and many other trade associations in the energy sector across the nation, we have made tremendous inroads in cleaning up our environmental profile with cleaner burn with the cleaner burning fuel, advances in technology with higher efficiency equipment, and advanced smart controls. It's an ongoing process our industry prides itself on, being innovative, forward-thinking problem solvers. That's what we do best, provide space heating and com- cooling comfort solutions. With my written testimony, I provided two technical study documents, the IHS Market Study, Heating Oil Transitioning to Biodiesel Blends 2023-2050, through 2050, and the Kearney Report, Roadmap to Success, Achieving a Net Zero Carbon Future by 2050. Both provide the science and technical data needed to help you make an informed decision for the Rhode Island energy consumers. Your constituents have entrusted in you the responsibility to identify sustainable energy solutions, ensuring ensuring equitable, equitable, healthy outcomes. We are racing against the clock to meet our state and regional greenhouse gas reduction goals and renewable energy goals. S-357 is a seamless bridge solution to help Rhode Island meet those goals. We respectfully ask the members of this committee to use this window of opportunity to realize the immediate carbon reduction benefits of higher biodiesel blends and vote to support passage of this amended legislation. In closing, and on a lighter note, I'd like to share the philosophy of our member company of one of our member companies if it ain't broke that doesn't mean it still can't be improved s357 is a bold and innovative step for Rhode island which will contribute and ensure a sustainable equitable equitable clean energy economy and future happy to answer any questions or follow up offline thank you so very much for your time and consideration thank you roberta are there any questions for this witness Okay, I I don't see any. Thank you so much for your testimony. And thank you very much. Good night. Good night. And I believe we should be joined by Drew Carlson. Drew, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, let us know uh, what company or organization you're with, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Drew Carlson from Global Partners. Global is a leading distributor and marketer for a variety of energy products in the Northeast and throughout the Mid-Atlantic. Within Rhode Island, Global operates a wholesale wholesale petroleum terminal and operates 11 gas stations and convenience stores. Um, Today, Rhode Island heating oil companies proudly deliver a 5% blend of bioheat to all heating oil customers in the state. Bioheat is a sustainable, renewable energy source made domestically in the United States that burns cleaner and more efficiently than traditional home heating oil that was used generations ago. As you know, Senate Bill 357 would mandate increasing requirements of bio-based products in heating oil. This would increase on a set schedule until July 2030 when 50% would be biodiesel and a renewable hydrocarbon diesel product in heating oil. Global actually first started selling heating oil in Boston over 75 years ago during the Great Depression. 
Uh, the heating oil industry is actually a foundation of the company. We see biodiesel as another evolution to the business. Um, we started selling coal during, you know, the winter 75 years ago, and, and biodiesel is just another example of how far the industry has come and continues to evolve uh, over the years. Global also operates facilities in Massachusetts where we've seen great benefits in the expanded use of clean, renewable biofuel, and significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are being achieved. Under the Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard, which is a program that incentivizes biofuel blends of 10% or higher, heating oil use in Massachusetts has actually been cut by 35 million gallons. Since the program started in January of 2018, more than 80 retail heating oil companies across the Commonwealth are participating, and the program is expected to grow in 2021 and beyond. The APS program shows us that replacing conventional heating oil with increasing percentages of liquid biofuel is the most expedient and cost-effective path to aggressive carbon reduction emissions. Um, again, I just ask for your support in this bill. You know, we have a drop in fuel that we can help the, st the state meet its climate goals, and we really want to partner with the state. And uh, thank you for your, your time and consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. And I believe we should be joined by Stephen Dodge. And Stephen, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, let us know what organization you're with, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Stephen Dodge. I am Director of State Regulatory Affairs for the National Biodiesel Board, and I am here to offer testimony in support of Senate Bill 357, and I've also uh, offered uh, submitted written testimony as well. Uh, just for, by way of background, NBB is an almost 30-year-old national trade association which represents the biodiesel, renewable diesel, and renewable jet fuel industries. NBB members play a key role in state and national programs aimed at reducing carbon emissions, displacing petroleum, improving public health, and protecting the environment. Biodiesel, as you've heard, is a renewable, low-carbon replacement for petroleum distillate which is made from used cooking oil, animal fats, brown grease, and agricultural byproducts and co-products. And as others have said, the heating oil industry in the Northeast is proactively working towards reducing the carbon intensity of its fuel. The so-called Providence Resolution, passed right in Providence, adopted in 2019, established the very attainable goal of net zero emissions with 100% biodiesel fuel by 2050. Low-carbon liquid fuels will play a key role in the future of home heating in the Northeast, and other Northeast states have recognized that role. You should be proud of the fact that Rhode Island was the first state in the country to pass a bioheat mandate back in 2013, a mandate now in effect which requires that at least 5% of all liquid heating fuel contain a biocomponent. Other jurisdictions have followed Rhode Island's lead. New York and the metropolitan area currently have a B5 mandate, with the city proper requiring 20% blends by 2034, and there is a legislative proposal in New York to increase the mandate statewide to be 20 by 2034. That bill has already passed the New York Senate. Massachusetts, as you've heard, currently has a robust incentive program for bioheat, and a bioheat mandate bill recently passed the Connecticut Energy and Technology Committee by a 25 to 1 vote. That bill mandates B5 starting next year and ramps up similar to this bill to B50 by 2035. The B50 date for this bill is 2030. In addition to lowering CO2 emissions by an average of 73%, biodiesel significantly reduces harmful criteria pollutants created from the combustion of petroleum. These pollutants have been shown to lead to chronic health effects, especially in urban communities. Preliminary results of a health benefit study done by Trinity Consultants shows the use of biodiesel in space heating reduces cancer rates and asthma attacks by 85%, as well as a reduction in premature deaths and lost work days. Now, one of the cities studied was Providence. For Providence and the five-mile radius surrounding the census tract study, Results show an estimated reduction in the cancer burden by 9.7 cases. That's an 86% reduction, along with an avoided three premature deaths 
almost 1,200 asthma attacks and 256 lost work days. That equates to a valuation, when you put it in dollars and cents, of about, of about $21.3 million in avoided costs. So I'll just wrap up and leave the committee with this one thought. The transition to electricity is a laudable goal and can make sense if it's affordable, the infrastructure is capable of handling the load, and the source of electricity is truly low carbon. However, reaching that level of decarbonization will take many years and lots of money. And in that time, without the use of low-carbon petroleum replacements, the public will continue to be exposed to high levels of air pollution. So during that gradual transition, it would make sense for the state to pursue on a parallel track the broadest possible decarbonization of the existing heating sector, including heating households with biodiesel blends that can lower life cycle carbon emissions by up to 80% and provide substantial health benefits especially to low-income and disadvantaged communities. Biodiesel can provide those benefits immediately with little to no cost to consumers or the state since it is a drop in fuel. I hope the bill gets reported out of the committee. And, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with this committee and your staff during the upcoming session. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony tonight. Thank you. And I believe that is the last witness we have speaking on um, Senate Bill 357. And just uh, to draw the committee's attention and also make the members of the public aware, we did also uh, receive a letter, um, a letter from the Rhode Island Business Coalition and it uh, is in support of the legislation. And as Chair Sosnowski mentioned, we do also have a letter from the, D the Rhode Island DEM asking, uh, asking for some amendments to the legislation. Um, and with that, I believe we should have Hannah Marini on with us. And so Hannah, if you're there, if you can go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, let us know what organization you're with and you can go ahead with your testimony. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, my name is Hannah Marini. Um, I am the Director of Business Development for Green Development, LLC, um, and I will be testifying on both Bills 472 uh, with Sub-A and Bill 474. Um, so Green Development is a Rhode Island-based renewable energy company. We are located in Cranston, Rhode Island. We are the um, largest developer of wind in the state and one of the largest developers of solar projects in the state. Uh, we currently employ 85 people out of our Cranston office. Uh, we will be up to 100 people this year. Um, and our customers are, uh, most of our customers are municipalities, nonprofits, universities, uh, and other um, eligible uh, net metering customers under Rhode Island, uh, under Rhode Island law. Um, we are, so I'll start with 472 with sub-A, uh, the sub-A that we submitted yesterday. Um, the bill, this bill, uh, we are in full support of this bill. It enhances the equity of um, the state's renewable energy programs because it increases the access to the benefits of renewable energy to low, moderate income um, individuals, and it preserves the rights of organizations that help the most disadvantaged uh, of our Rhode Island, um, Rhode Island population. Uh, these are savings programs, community remote net metering and virtual net metering. These are savings programs that invest in both projects and the industry while delivering meaningful savings. Our customers include Crossroads Rhode Island, the Amos House Food Bank, uh, the Rhode Island Community Food Bank, the YMCA, Westerly Libraries, Church Community Housing, Women's Development Corporation, um, the Catholic Diocese, and most of their individual parishes, uh, and Johnson & Wales University. Um, most of those organizations, um, in addition to a, a, quite a few um, public uh, housing uh, organizations and cities and towns and school departments, uh, most of these organizations save about 30% on their electric bills from remotely sited renewable energy projects. Um, and uh, the Community Remote Net Metering Program provides access to savings programs for individual homeowners um, from, 
from remotely sited projects as well. And these are really important because not everybody has the the real estate or the you know the nice new roof to put solar on. Um, so they really benefit from the economies of scale of these projects, and they benefit from uh, developers like Green and others from being able to pick. Uh, the, the best, most cost-effective locations for these projects, projects where there is affordable interconnection, um, where the towns are, are favorable to allowing these projects. Uh, and it really, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that it is, it is working, um, and the best thing that we can do is expand these programs for Rhode Islanders. Uh, the, um, the only... If, if there is any improvements that, that the committee was looking to make on this bill, um, and the same goes with 474, the, uh, the co-locating, um, the co-locating, we would like to see, to see that, uh, softened a little bit. Um, and, uh, with that, I'm actually going to shift over to 474. Um, we so we are in, well, actually we're in strong support of 472 with the sub A. I just want to make that crystal clear. I'm happy to answer any questions on that um, before I move on, or would you rather have me go right into 474? Um, let's let's take a break and see if the committee has any questions on your first uh, first set of testimony. And I don't see any, so I think you can proceed. Thank you. Um, I'll be even, uh, so I submitted written testimony for both of these bills as well, so I'm trying my best not to be repetitive and just make sure I, I hit the highlights. This one will be even more brief. Um, so 474, we are actually opposed to. Um, we do not, uh, we do not agree with the limits on siting renewable energy projects without any incentives to move, uh, to move these projects to more preferred locations. Um, what that is going to do, having sticks without carrots, is going to slow down the, the, the growth of the renewable energy industry and then the number of projects that are producing the, the clean energy that our state needs to meet its goals. Um, I would say at the very least, uh, at the very least, you know, so we're opposed to this bill together, but we, the project should be vested um, with any project that's submitted an interconnection application to National Grid should be vested uh, in the net metering program prior to um, prior to this, this uh, the co-locating provisions taking effect. Um, and the reason is that it takes about three or four years for an interconnection to go through with National Grid right now, and lots of uh, time and monetary investments. Um, so these are changes, you know, minimal changes that uh, we would like to see if that bill, if 474, was to go forward. Um, and I believe, oh, so the only other point I wanted to make just to really drive this home is that we were thinking, we were looking at it today, and just in projects that my company has uh, in active development, so... Um, actually late stage development, so projects that are fully permitted, under construction, or waiting for one small final approval from one of the agencies, uh, we're looking at an investment just from our company alone of over $90 million. So changing the rules at this point in time without any vesting of projects would be very, very harmful um, to the renewable energy industry that does employ a lot of people and is building projects that our society needs very badly right now. And that is it from me. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for this witness? Um, Senator DeMario. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for that input. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as you've been, as you were speaking to um, the, you know, the kind of balance between trying to incentivize um, or, or move more toward using these preferred locations has to be balanced out with cost considerations. Um, and I, you know, I would certainly welcome further communication or input on, on this as we try to figure out that problem. So thank you. Uh, we're happy to be in touch, thanks. And um, Senator Archambault. Thank you very much. Just from a uh, practical standpoint, I agree with the vesting uh, provision, but from a zoning perspective, any any cases that would be in the pipeline already, as a matter of law, would be vested. 
um, it's cloaked in the doctrine of detrimental reliance. You can't start something like that and, and uh, change the law. Not that that's the sponsor's intent, but um, but I do understand the the uh, suggesting of, of making it on its face part of the law, so there's no ambiguity. I get it, but I, I wanted to add that typically things that are in the pipeline are, are vested uh, because the laws change. You get people that start on a course of action, and something changes, and there's money and time and energy. So just want to point that out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Archimbold. Are there any additional questions or comments for this witness? Okay, I see none. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you very much. And um, I believe we are joined by Julian Dash. And Julian, if you can um, turn down the volume um, in the background, it was coming across a little bit, and there's a bit of a delay on the sound. Um, but you are on live with the committee, and so you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know what organization you're with, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Yes, I'll, I'll try to get the background noise out. I apologize. My name is Julian Dash. I'm with Clean Economy Development. We are a Providence-based renewable energy consulting firm. Uh, we represent a wide range of public agencies, quasi-public cities, towns, um, and nonprofits, including educational and affordable housing. I wanted to voice uh, support for this legislation, um, but support with um, with an amendment. I, I forgive me. I'm not sure if the amendment. All the changes have been presented um, via sub A to the committee, but I'll explain the, the amendments very briefly. Uh, the amendments th that we seek in support with this legislation just simply provides a, a very simple clarification that um, more than one eligible nonprofit can participate in remote net metering and receive credits from a remote system. Uh, this um, slight amendment and change does not expand the program nor expand any eligibility. It just simply provides pre a, a pre-existing contract with the clarity they need going forward as there has been some question uh, regarding this eligibility that's recently been raised. Many nonprofits already have these remote net metering contracts. They've been on contracts and receiving savings for years now. Uh, so it simply not only provides the clarification but makes sure that they uh, aren't at risk of losing their remote net metering contracts and the savings that they've come to rely on, uh, which if they did lose those uh, remote net metering credits, it would be very significantly, uh, it would very significantly negatively impact uh, their economics as they budgeted for them. Many of the nonprofits that we represent that unfortunately couldn't make it today, but I'll um, uh, just note them for you, uh, that have remote net metering contracts and are dependent on these savings, uh, they include organizations across the state, like Crossroads Rhode Island. Amos House is planning on entering into a contract. The Rhode Island Community Food Bank, a range of affordable housing groups, such as Omni Development, Church Community Housing, Women's Development, One Neighborhood Builders, as well as many other nonprofits, I believe some of which either are on testimony this evening or have their representatives on testimony this evening. Um, so with that, I am trying to be brief. I believe we have three minutes by my count. I have about 15 seconds left. So um, we support this legislation. We support it with those amendments that I noted, and these amendments will ensure that these great nonprofits and more to come will be able to continue um, saving on their electricity bills through remote net metering and continuing to do the good and great work that they do across the state. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. You too. And we should be joined now by Meg Kerr. Meg, welcome to the committee. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, let us know what organization you're with, and you can go ahead on testifying on both pieces of legislation um, for this evening. Thank you very much, Chair Oyer. My name is Meg Kerr. I'm the Senior Director of Policy at the Audubon Society of Rhode Island, and I'm here to testify on 474 and 472, and I'll start with 474. Um, 
We appreciate having this bill in play and thank Senator DiMario for sponsoring it. Um, we at Audubon um, understand and believe strongly that climate change is the crisis we all face. We support the rapid de deployment of renewable energy projects, solar and wind and offshore wind, knowing that we have to quickly transition off of fossil fuel. Um, but we also recognize that forested lands have a critical role to play both as habitat for birds and wildlife and in the, in the climate change uh, world for carbon, sequestra carbon sequestration. And we are concerned and have been concerned for a number of years about very large solar projects being built on previously forested lands. Um, we know that our renewable energy laws are working well. Um, solar projects are being built uh, throughout the state. But the laws themselves cap the size of those projects. So the net metering statute states that a project can only be 10 megawatts in size which is about 50 acres. It's big. 10 megawatts is a big project. Um, but as we've heard from people who have testified before, um, projects are being co-located on adjacent properties. So the, the fact that the statute caps the project size at 10 megawatt is somewhat moot because uh, 10 megawatt projects are bu being built right next to each other. Um, in my testimony, I include examples of um, some of these larger projects that have been written about in the ECO-RI newsletter. Um, I'll just mention one that is being built in North Smithfield. And when it is completed, it'll be 38.4 megawatts. And um, the developer has split it into nine, nine megawatts, um, each less than nine megawatts. Anyway, just stay under the 10 megawatt threshold. But 38.4 megawatts is huge and much larger than the 10 megawatt cap. Um, and as the sponsor has said, the, the way the bill is written, it would allow these um, larger sites, uh, larger projects in preferred locations already developed, but would uh, um, eliminate co-location of solar projects in greenfield sites. Um, and we do think that we need to start taking action as a state to uh, limit the uh, proliferation of these large solar projects in greenfield sites. Um, and so we, th we think this is an important step. And on the uh, sort of vesting or grandfathering of the projects, that certainly makes sense. But we shouldn't be encouraging additional development of these very large solar projects in forested areas. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I'll make a few comments on 472. Um, we um, appreciate a lot of things about this bill. Um, I, um, folks that have testified previously mentioned a sub -A. I have not seen a sub -A, so I'm not sure exactly what it said. Um, but the version that the original bill um, uh, allows, it specified that a third of the sites would be um, directed away from forested areas to already developed or disturbed sites, which we appreciate but it would allow two-thirds of the expansion still to happen on greenfield sites. And we would rather that we not continue developing on greenfield sites if we can avoid it. Um, let's see. So the um, Office of Energy Resources uh, hired Synapse Energy, and they recently completed an analysis of solar siting opportunities for Rhode Island in these preferred sites. They looked at rooftops, landfills, gravel pits, brownfields, commercial and industrial developed and undeveloped lots, and parking lot carport solar. Um, they looked at the total potential in these sites, and the study found that with all of those sites together, there were between 3,000 and 7,000 megawatts of potential, technical potential, for um, solar development. Um, I've been told by some of the developers they have concerns that this um, study maybe overestimates how much is available, but I will just point out that the bill is asking for an expansion of 60 megawatts, so even if they're 10 times off, almost 100 times off, there's plenty of capacity in these um, already developed areas that were examined by Synapse Energy. Um, so we would prefer to see the bill amended so that any new development is directed to already developed sites 
And again, we would be fine with a grandfathering clause recognizing that developers have invested a lot in these projects already, and um, we wouldn't want to put that at risk. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you so much, Meg. Thank you. I believe we should be joined by Seth Handy. Seth, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee as well as any organizations you're representing, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Seth Handy. I'm speaking on behalf of my firm tonight. I'm not representing anyone. I'm a lawyer in downtown Providence who has been working in the energy space for many years in Rhode Island. Um, <clears throat> I'm supporting Senate Bill 472 and thankful to its sponsors. Uh, first of all, I support expansion of, of uh, community net metering. Uh, we, we desperately need more uh, opportunities for off-takers in the industry in order to keep the production of these projects moving forward on the scale uh, uh, that the state goals uh, implicate. Uh, so it's really important to keep expanding these programs. Uh, uh, net metering customers provide more benefit than cost to the system, and so there's really no good reason to limit access to these programs, particularly when uh, the community net metering program is meant to benefit people that don't have access to rooftops or the capital to do these projects themselves. It's an important policy to, to expand. Um, I, I uh, ob object to the provision that would take the capacity value away from the developer. I don't think that there's any basis to do that. I know that OER did a study uh, in association with that recommendation, but uh, it wasn't a transparent study, and it was faulty in a lot of ways that many of us commented on, and uh, those comments really weren't recognized or integrated into the study, which is a great concern to me. Again, these projects provide more benefit than cost to the system and to ratepayers, uh, so there's no reason to transfer value streams from the developers to, to, to others. And then I, I also support the sub-A that's been talked about tonight. Uh, this is in response to a recent PUC decision uh, that indicated that multiple public entities and or nonprofits uh, may not be able to receive net metering credits from a single project. Uh, that's a problematic decision because it overlooked a, a definition in the statute that allows remote net metering customers, qualified remote net metering customers, to send credits to more than one customer of record. Um, I'm very concerned about the decision. We're going to appeal the decision. We are, I was, I was uh, uh, active in, in the case, uh, but um, it will take too long to have it uh, fixed uh, through an appeal to the Supreme Court, and in the meantime, it will send a bad message to developers looking to do business in Rhode Island, and it will really hurt nonprofits and uh, public entities that are already taking advantage of the flexibility in the program. So, um, with that, I will. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay. I, I don't see any. Thank you so much, Seth. Thank you. Good night. And we should be joined by um, Sean Burke. Sean, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee and uh, let us know what organization you're with, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair O'Hare and members of the committee. My name is Sean Burke, and I work for NECEC, the Northeast Clean Energy Council. We're a clean energy business policy and innovation organization whose mission is to create a world-class clean energy hub right here in the Northeast. We cover all of the clean energy market segments representing the business perspectives of investors and in clean energy companies. I'm here today to offer our support for S472, uh, and in the interest of time, I'll point to our written testimony submitted earlier today and keep my remarks brief. The bill before you represents a proposal to strengthen the state's commitment to community solar, uh, which is an important piece of the transition to a clean energy economy. 
Community solar allows residents who may not otherwise be able to participate uh, in a solar project the opportunity to do so. This modest expansion of the community remote net metering pilot implements many elements discussed during, the, during OER's stakeholder process uh, in which NECEC has been closely involved. We're particularly supportive of the proposal to require a percentage of subscribers to be low and moderate income. Uh, equity must be a component of our entire suite of clean energy policies as we ensure that all communities are benefiting from the transition to a cleaner economy. Uh, we support this bill with one amendment, and, and uh, Seth just touched on it. it uh, we request the removal of the section that would transfer the capacity rights uh, for community remote net metering projects to National Grid. Capacity is an inc increasingly important value stream for projects, and if the capacity rights were to be automatically transferred to National Grid, projects may be prevented from pairing with energy storage now and in the future. Uh, and that's due to the way that, that the regional grid operator, ISO New England, treats paired solar and storage assets. So we encourage the removal of that section around capacity rights. Uh, and with that revision, we support S-472 and respectfully request that this committee support the bill uh, as it constitutes a modest expansion of the successful pilot. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we should be uh, joined by Sue Anderbaugh. Sue, if you, uh, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee and let us know uh, what bills you're testifying on and you can go ahead with your testimony. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sue Anderbois. I am the Climate and Energy Program Manager at the Nature Conservancy here in Rhode Island. Um, I'll be testifying on Bills 474 and 472, and I'm actually really glad that they're um, together because I think it, there's a lot of overlap in what I'd want to say. Um, so I'll start with 474, um, and I want to thank um, the Senate sponsors for sponsoring this. To be clear, the Nature Conservancy is strongly in support of Bill 474, um, I'll read, um, I won't read from my testimony. You can see um, what I've already put in there, um, but we'll just say um, when the net metering law was written a decade ago, um, the virtual net metering wasn't really a thing yet, <laughs> um, and people weren't imagining these system sizes that would get quite so large. And so the law did include um, a limit to system size of 10 megawatts, which, as Meg Kerr already mentioned, is about 50 acres. Um, this is a really simple um, bill that would just hold the um, hold the legislation to its original intent to limit system size to about 10 megawatts or to exactly 10 megawatts, but with the caveat that if the systems are sited in preferred areas, then they can be larger than 10 megawatts. And so preferred areas are things like carports, gravel pits, uh, closed landfills, former industrial sites, and we are blessed with uh, a lot of that type of infrastructure in Rhode Island. Um, to, I just want to address, um, Hannah Marini brought up a great point about um, we really see that this is uh, kind of the first step and totally understand that developers um, do need incentives to site projects in preferred locations. I want to point out uh, one quick thing. So in Rhode Island, we do have two different programs. We have the net metering program and we have the uh, uh, REG program, which is the Renew Renewable Energy Growth. The virtual net metering program, the rates for that program are actually set in statute. And so there isn't really the ability to change um, to change the incentives um, to to preferred sites. That's that's been really tough, and I think that's part of what I'm going to touch on in 472. The renewable energy growth program does allow for annual changes based on different costs and different um, you know the legislation specifically calls out locational incentives. Um, and so I think that this would be a prime thing that we would love to work um, on with uh, with the General Assembly in future years and also the um, DG board that oversees the renewable energy growth to ensure that we're getting the incentives right and expanding the renewable energy growth program so that it can um, really help build out the, the um, projects in the areas that I think all Rhode Islanders would like them to see. So we really strongly support um, 474. Um, and would love to see it pass out of out of committee. Um, I'm happy to jump to 472, but just wanted to pause in case uh, there's any questions on 474. Do the committee members have any questions on the tes testimony provided so far? Um, I don't see any, Sue. So you can go ahead. Awesome. Um, 
So I first want to say, so the Nature Conservancy um, uh, has submitted testimony in opposition to 472. I do want to say we really appreciate the updates to this legislation, including the changes around the 10 megawatt, what we call the 10 megawatt loophole, and um, specifically carving out um, a third of the sites for um, preferred areas. However, um, the Nature Conservancy does believe that any expansion to virtual net metering, which again does not allow for any sort of like locational incentives or anything like that, any expansion to virtual net metering needs to be made um, only after more thoroughly addressing the siting issue um, that we've just discussed. Um, and virtual net metering is actually the primary program that's driving projects that are causing um, uh, the, the larger projects that cause deforestation. So the Renewable Energy Growth Program I already mentioned is the other program. Their, their system size cap is at 5 megawatts. Um, and so there is definitely room to play with that, especially for, for preferred locations. Um, but these larger programs are actually coming from the virtual net metered program. Um, the Nature Conservancy would support this if we if we saw that it was primarily focused on um, siting projects in preferred locations instead of just a third. Um, a third does mean that two thirds can be <laughs> in um, important uh, green spaces, and so we just want to make sure that any um, any expansion is directed at those uh, preferred locations and not in. Um, in undisturbed forest. Um, and really hear Hannah's point from earlier about these vested projects and would love to work with her and with other developers and with the sponsor um, to figure out what might be an appropriate grandfathering that would allow um, the projects already in motion to go forward, but then any future projects to be um, pushed toward the more preferred sites. Um, I'll also point out one slight difference. Um, the 10 megawatt um, language in this bill is slightly different in that it allows for projects owned by different owners to be co-located. So this says um, under the same ownership um, can't be co-located. Um, and if this bill did move forward, we'd love for them to use the 10 megawatt language that Senator DiMario um, put forward instead, um, which doesn't allow for that kind of co-location. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. And we really look forward to working with the bill sponsor and with others um, to strengthen this. Thank you, Sue. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I, I don't see any. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. You too. And we should be joined by Michelle Carpenter. Michelle, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, let us know what organization you're, you're with and what bill you're testifying on, and you can go ahead. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Oyer, members of the committee. I'm testifying on Senate Bill 472. My name is Michelle Carpenter, and I'm the Managing Director of Development for Turning Point Energy, and I live in Charlestown. Uh, Turning Point Energy is a small community solar development company that's been active in Rhode Island since 2016, when the General Assembly first launched the community solar program. Under this program, we were able to complete two projects that created more than 150 jobs. I'm here today because the community solar program that we rely on is now full. We can't invest any more in Rhode Island, we can't create any more jobs, and we can't offer any more power now to provide continuity that will allow businesses such as us to continue to make responsible investments in the state. At 60 megawatts, um, this expansion is incredibly modest compared to some of the neighboring states. Massachusetts has approximately 1,500 megawatts. Connecticut has 175, New York has 2,000, and Maine, which has a similar population to Rhode Island, actually has an uncapped program. Um, I, I also wanted to let this committee know that I support this bill not only as an energy advocate, but also as an environmental advocate. I was personally involved in the two-year stakeholder process led by OER and the Division of Statewide Planning around solar to land use, and I care deeply about these issues. Um, this bill, as you've heard uh, a couple of folks mention, includes two significant concessions um, to the environmental community that we are supportive of. Um, this is a prohibition on co-location and the first ever requirement to that mandates a portion of the program be cited in previously disturbed areas. A, a few examples of projects we have developed, such as those, is um, one we developed in North Smithfield, which was developed under the pilot program. It's, it's not the 38 megawatt one that was referred to earlier in testimony. It's a different one. Um, this project was located on a parcel that was contaminated with PFAS, and it was adjacent to a Superfund site. Um, another project we're currently developing is on a golf course in Warren. 
you know, these are these are the types of projects that our company hopes to develop um, in this program. Beyond uh, environmental issues, this bill is also about equity. Uh, all Rhode Islanders should have access to the green economy, and the 20% carve-out included here for low- and moderate-income customers will ensure this equitable access. Um, finally, please be aware that time is of the essence for my company as the program is currently full. We want to continue to put Rhode Island on a path to clean energy future, but if this bill doesn't pass, then our company will unfortunately be forced to leave Rhode Island. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any, uh, yes, Senator Common has a question. Go ahead. Thank Senator. you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Michelle. I was, I was curious about the extent to which you have partnerships either developed or in the pipeline to help with this 20% carve out to go to low and moderate income Rhode Islanders. Is there infrastructure in place for that for you all? Absolutely, that's, that's a great question, Senator Common. So we have been actively working with the George Wiley Center um, who provided a letter of support for this bill. And we hope to work with them to ensure equitable access. I'm sorry. Can I ask you to repeat that? The, the feed cut out. Okay. I was getting a little bit of feedback myself. Um, so that's a great question. We've been actively working with the George Wiley Center, uh, who provided a letter of support for this bill. And we want to work with them to ensure equitable access to clean energy. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for this witness? Okay, I don't, I don't see any. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. And I believe we should be joined by uh, James Feinstein. And James, if you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to the committee, let us know what organization you're with, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Yes, thank you. Chair, Vice Chair, and esteemed members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important legislation. I am James Feinstein, Policy and Regulatory Lead in the Northeast for Arcadia. We are a community solar market leader, managing more than 300 megawatts of residential community solar subscriptions across seven states. In Rhode Island, we are managing 36 megawatts of community solar across four live projects and two more scheduled to come online later this year. Once those projects are energized, we will be providing bill, guaranteed bill savings to more than 7,000 Rhode Islanders. The one thing I would like for you to take away from my testimony today is the fraction two-thirds. Two-thirds of American households, or 85 million homes, aren't a good fit for rooftop solar for one reason or another. That is as true across Rhode Island as it is across the country. Comprehensive studies routinely show that the benefits of community solar extend far beyond program participants, and the overall benefits outweigh the costs for all families across the state. In the past year alone, four significant studies have shown that distributed generation, like community solar, provides more benefits than cost. As was mentioned earlier today, the Rhode Island PUC Commission study released last month found that the CRNM Community Solar Program provided $41 million in net benefits to the state. A Synapse study released last year showed that distributed generation across New England um, provided $1 billion in savings in just five years, and a comprehensive nationwide report found that adding significant solar and storage will cost $88 billion less than continuing business as usual. As Rhode Island reaches toward its ambitious renewable energy goals, we need to consider prudent program developments, and I strongly ask you to expand the community solar program so all Rhode Islanders, including the two-thirds that can't have rooftop solar, have the option to participate in the state's clean energy future. Today, 19 states in Washington, D.C. have policy-backed community solar programs. Last year, Massachusetts doubled their community solar program from 1,600 to 3,200 megawatts and New York expanded theirs from three to six gigawatts. Other states are doubling down on this budget positive approach to solar generation and Rhode Island should not be left behind. Thank you for your time and Arcadia asks for the committee to take action this session to pass this bill. Thanks and I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for this witness? And I do not see any. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And we should be joined by Hank Webster. Hank, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, let us know what organization you're representing, and you can go ahead with your testimony on um, both bills. Uh, thank you, Chair Oyer and members of the committee. My name is Hank Webster, and I am the Rhode Island Director of Acadia Center. Uh, no affiliation with uh, Arcadia Power. Um, sometimes we do run up against each other uh, <laughs> in these hearings, so I just wanted to clarify that for the committee. Uh, I appreciate uh, the efforts on these bills. Acadia Center was also a member of the state's solar siting stakeholder group that uh, did study these issues over a long period of time, so definitely understand how difficult uh, some of this can be to hash out. Uh, in general, we support the intent of both bills. We support the expansion of community net metering, and we need to protect Rhode Island's forest lands. Uh, 472 seeks to achieve the former, and 474 aims to achieve the latter. We believe the state should be looking at how these two um, concepts can work together. And if I may offer a couple of observations on the bills, I would note that on 472, on page 2, the proposed language under Section C mentions the term under common ownership. I believe this has been raised by uh, previous um, callers. Uh, I think that undermines the intent to avoid development of contiguous parcels, um, the under common ownership um, language specifically, it's not hard to imagine that a developer or developers seeking to, um, you know, build these larger projects could simply establish, you know, sub-LLCs for each development to get around that protection. Uh, and the intent is is to protect the uh, nature and ecosystem of the land. So the the overriding ownership is not really the, the issue at, at stake here. Um, on... 472, I, I appreciate the minimum allocation to low and moderate income customers. Uh, Acadia Center would support any efforts to increase that amount as well. Um, as the previous callers have noted, uh, you know, not everyone can uh, take advantage of this program. They don't have or, uh, a rooftop solar, so it's good to have access to this program for as many Rhode Islanders as possible. And finally, on 474, uh, I would offer that under certain circumstances and certain designs of renewable energy systems, that farmland could also be construed um, or considered uh, as a preferred site. Uh, Acadia Center partnered with the American Farmland Trust to explore solar projects that can coexist with working farmlands. And in our climate, that additional revenue that a solar project could um, deliver to a farm could help them survive, could help keep that land from being developed for other purposes like commercial or housing space. Um, we certainly don't want to necessarily see uh, that be a loophole to these efforts, but I uh, just wanted to uh, note that that could be another way to also consider a preferred sites. So, um with that, I just wanted to express our support. Uh, we hope that there can be some, some improvements to the bills, but certainly support them uh, working together to protect uh, Rhode Island's uh, forest lands and develop renewable solar. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you, Hank. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you so much, Hank, for your testimony. Thank you, Chair. And we should be joined by Sam uh, Fiegenbaum. And Sam, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee and what organization you're with, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. My name is Sam Feigenbaum. I manage political affairs for Kearsarge Energy, a leading solar energy company doing business in Rhode Island. Through this testimony, I urge this committee to adopt proposed amendment sub A to S-472. As I testified so far this Monday, the PUC upset the status quo and undertook a decision to prohibit nonprofit entities from joining together or joining with municipalities to serve as multiple off-takers for a single remote net metering project in Rhode Island. This decision presents a major barrier to renewable energy growth in the state for two principal reasons. First, most nonprofits do not use enough electricity to serve as a single off-taker for a remote net metering project. Second, many new nonprofits do not have the credit grade needed for a developer to receive debt and tax equity financing for a remote, a remote net metering project. Pairing nonprofits with municipalities, uh, given the creditworthiness of most municipalities, solve this, solves this problem. Just for Kearsarge Energy alone, this PUC decision imperils over $130 million worth of projects 
and threatens the savings Kearsarge has secured for multiple hospitals, schools, and other nonprofits. Amendment sub A would simply reverse the PUC decision and restore the status quo. Kearsarge has also submitted written testimony on this topic. Um, that's all I've got for the committee at the moment. I figured I'd keep things brief. Thanks again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any um, are there any questions for this witness? Okay, I do not see any. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thanks again. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. And I believe that was the last uh, person from the public we had to testify on 472. Um, I did want to bring the committee's attention to a number of letters in addition with, uh, to the verbal testimony we received. Um, National Grid did su submit a letter in concern. Um, we also got a letter from the, the PUC. And they offered to help uh, help with the legislation but don't appear to take a uh, position on the bill. Uh, the DPUC similarly uh, submitted a letter. They have um, concerns about the, the scope of the bill. Um, uh, Mayor Alorza submitted a letter in support of the bill. Um, the Conservation Law Foundation um, also submitted a letter on the bill. Um, with concerns about the legislation. Uh, George Wiley Center submitted a letter in support of the bill. And Gravity Renewables is in support of the legislation. Church Community Housing Corporation and Ecosystem Solutions and Green Steel Environmental and Jordan Goyette and Nautilus Solar and Coalition for Community Access as well as Commonwealth Engineers and Consultants, DEPCOM Power and Oak Square Partners have all submitted uh, written testimony in support. Um, as with regard to Senate Bill 474, I believe we've already heard from all of the uh, witnesses who are going to provide verbal testimony. And we also have uh, testimony in opposition to that legislation from Angel Lopez of Providence. And uh, the Conservation Law Foundation is in support of that legislation. And uh, Save the Bay, um, Save the Bay submitted comments on the legislation. And Grow Smart Rhode Island submitted a letter uh, suggesting amendments to Senate 474. And with that, I think we're moving on to public testimony for the final bill before us tonight, which is uh, Senate Bill 572. And I believe our first witness uh, should be Rachel McIntosh. And so, Rachel, you are on with the committee. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know, um, let us know what organization you represent, if any, and then you can go ahead with your testimony. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this. Um, my name's Rachel McIntosh. I'm here to talk about the Rhode Island Geoengineering and Hazardous Emissions Act. I was on the geoengineering, um, the House Geoengineering Study Commission. Um, I, in two th I'm, I'm a mother of two teenagers, and I'm really into ensuring a healthy future for our next generation. My professional background is in defense contracting, and so I ended up doing a lot of research for the Geoengineering Study Committee um, and put together. I believe I submitted it with my uh, paperwork, uh, the table of contents. It was 10 three-inch binders, and the table of contents is 20, <laughs> 20 pages long, and it's hyperlinked. If you're able to click on it, you can see that's, that's what we used over there. Um, and I also sent an email to all of you about um, a comment that was, or a question that was asked earlier when this bill was introduced. Somebody said there was no geoengineering going on in Rhode Island. There's three programs currently impacting Rhode Island, and I just wanted you to know that. Um, I'll cut mine kind of short here. I've handed in my testimony. It's written. Um, basically, 2017 is when I first sent in my first rainwater sa water sample, and that's how 
I got involved with this whole thing because I saw the geoengineering footprints in the water because I was sent to the lab, and they said, oh, this, none of this is really supposed to be here. I was like, okay, and that's how I ended up getting on the geoengineering study commission. Um, now, we need this. We urgently need this to protect our health, the environment, agriculture, coastal integrity, aviation safety, and the economy. We might expect the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to help in this regard. However, in reference to insufficient EPA oversight, the Federal Weather Enterprise, acknowledged in 2018, continued but, re and this is quote, continued but reduced attention is being paid to the effects of airborne toxins, ozone, and fine particulate matter on human health and the impact of air pollution and human health and sensitive ecosystems, unquote. That comes right from the Federal Weather Enterprise, which is a budget that appears under every presidency about how they manipulate the weather. Um, and I didn't know about this until I got on this geoengineering study commission. Now it's clearly apparent this is going on nonstop. Um, where the federal government lacks the needed protections, states are authorized to provide their own regulatory action. And this is the purpose of the Geoengineering and Hazardous Emissions Act. Our Department of Environmental Management, the DEM, will review applications, collect fees for them, hold hearings, and make determinations on proposed geoengineering activities. With the support of state officials and members of the public, our state environmental police officers will carry out that enforcement. Where unlicensed activity occurs, our DEM will collect fines and put them into a trust fund set up to disperse that money directly to the public via county. S0572 proposes regulations to prohibit the intentional manipulation of the environment by hazardous means. The Act provides that a person seeking to engage in geoengineering activity must meet health, safety, environmental requirements in order to procure a license from the Director of the Department of Environmental Management for any such activity. Um, in 2019, our House Geoengineering Study Committee received a letter from Mark Z. Jacobson, PhD from Stanford University. He's a professor of civil and environmental engineering who has over 30 years' experience, and he's got all different publications examining the impacts of natural and human-admitted gases and particulates, including from multiple transportation, energy, and artificial sources, on climate, stratospheric ozone, urban air pollution, and human health. Professor Jacobson read our Rhode Island bill, and he enthusiastically commented, and I'm going to quote this, I strongly support its goal to analyze and regulate any proposed geoengineering activity before it's put in place in the atmosphere or oceans because of the strong and widespread consequences of such activities and the fact that they do not solve atmospheric problems. They merely mask them for future generations to deal with while the underlying problems worsen. Now, for three years, Brown University has provided courses on geoengineering and related topics. Thus, our Geoengineering Act is now pretty overdue. And just so people get a clue on this, what is geoengineering? Because this is, people have a lot of ideas about this, but it's the, it's, this is the definition of it. It's the intentional manipulation of the environment involving nuclear, biological, chemical, electromagnetic, and or other physical agent activities that affect changes to the Earth's atmosphere or surface. And the geoengineering, um, it includes solar radiation management, which is called SRM, and carbon dioxide removal, which I heard somebody else talk about earlier here, CDR, and other diverse activities. It may involve ground-based, underwater, and or atmospheric activities such as cloud seeding and other deployments of chemical and physical agents by aircraft, rockets, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, large balloons, wireless infrastructure, ships, and submarines. The first category, the solar radiation management, which includes its but not limited to stratospheric aerosol injection. That's what you call that stuff you see in the sky such as, these are the other things, solar shields, atmospheric sunscreens, and here radioactive materials are injected into the atmosphere by aircraft, sometimes by means of cloud seeding, with the intention of increasing clouds reflectivity, or albedo. These materials then reflect heat from both above and below. The realized materials often include aluminum oxide, 
sulfur dioxide, and sulfuric acid, which then fall to the ground. Everyone agrees, from the EPA to the top professors to anti-air pollution activists, that these substances are harmful to living beings. And this is why the application process is laid out in a bill requires that these, those wishing to engage in geoengineering activities specify what they wish to do and what, which substances they want to use, and most importantly, show that the activities will not harm the health or the environment. The second category is big, carbon capture and sequestration, CCS. It involves capturing what is considered waste CO2 and depositing it at storage sites and then sequestering it there. And then, of course, quote, according to the Journal of CO2 Utilization, the environmental impacts such as acidification and human toxicity are higher with this approach. And then there can only, this can only be regarded as a temporary solution, particularly those options which merely delay the emissions of CO2 rather than eliminate them permanently. So, to protect against harmful geoengineering activities over Rhode Island, the bill requires a 1,000 application fee, proof of insurance and bonding, and for violations, a fine of $500,000 and potential jail time. We thus can expect to see substantial income. A 2018 paper by geoengineering expert J. Marvin Herdman, he's PhD, Journal of Geography, Environmental and Earth Science, Inter Inter International stated, deliberately polluting the atmosphere with particulate matter is not only, only unconscionable, but disastrous to human health, as their pollution is already leading, the, the leading environmental cause of disease and death worldwide. It is increasing at an alarming rate. So we have to ensure that our state's actively preventing these respiratory diseases and deaths, and as we've got this coronavirus thing going on. And speaking of which, I included in my um, testimony when the, I emailed this in, I, I noticed the morning that they shut the state house down for coronavirus that there was, because now I'm aware of what this stuff looks like, it's not normal clouds. Once you get know what this looks like, you can't unsee it. I was driving by Quonset Point, the sky was a complete mess, and they had decided they were talking on the radio, like, "Oh my gosh, you know, everybody's worried." Is it? Then nobody knew what it was, you know. And so traffic's coming out of Providence, and um, I was going by Quonset at like six thirty in the morning when I saw that, and I put a pan out, a Pyrex pan, because I knew it was going to start raining. It was literally the worst I had ever seen. And the next day, I put it on Facebook that I noticed this. I got, I don't know how many. 20-something people responded that they saw it, too, and I sent it in to the lab. It was the highest rating of geoengineering footprints that have ever come back for me personally. So, the, and this is, we drove in and we gave the bill, Jen Sherman, Bach, and I, we gave it to uh, Rep. Bennett, and he said, we're going to get this passed this year. This is, the respiratory stuff is really, really important. So, nonetheless, um, our bill is wide-ranging. It's protecting against both chemical and physical hazards based on existing laws and as a solid foundation for regulatory confidence with a history of bipartisan support in the House. It will be embraced by the legislature and the public alike. And with its substantial opportunities for substantive public participation, it will prove engaging. Finally, the money is intended to be collected by means of protecting our atmosphere should provide Rhode Island with a literal treasure trove of goodwill. The language of the of 0572 has been carefully combed over, vetted by our ultra astute attorneys and State House and beyond. So we're confident that you will enjoy reading the bill and you will co sponsor it and swiftly vote for it here and on the Senate floor. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Does anyone have any questions for this witness? Senator Miller. Um, you started out by mentioning that there are three projects that might be defined as geoengineering in Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, we're, it's impacting us. And let me read this off to you. I sent it off to every one of you at the committee, but I think some of the autoresponders were sending it back. The minute she said it, I was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, here's what they are. We got the Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics Aerosol Study over Northeast Atlantic Ocean 2021, and I put the link to that for you to see a PDF. Then we have the Solar Geo Geoengineering Research and Research Governance, which is they're trying to make government for us. 
Um, and that's the big thing about this act is that when we started adding up how much money is spent on this, uh, the the world over, it's when we hit just in the United States, we hit thirty trillion. We're like, oh geez, because every one of these clouds that I mentioned that I saw that morning, that would be a five hundred thousand dollar fine. So that day in itself would be, I don't know, a few million at least. A, several, I would say three million at least the day that morning in fines. But anyhow, so that was so the governance is. It's on. It's nonstop that all these different groups are trying to make governance for this, and we have to do this as a state. The other thing that I included in my email is um, a reference to a geoengineering lawsuit in, I believe it's Louisiana. States can be sued if they don't make it clear that they are anti or making it clear what it is in their state. The states can be sued. So I think this is a very important bill so that when somebody does try it, we say, no, we, we never allowed this to begin with. So I think this not only protects the state, it also enriches normal people through these fees and fines. And like I said, it's, it's a vast amount of money. Um, and then the last program is geoengineering funding from $100 million to $200 million in 2021, and they're proposing that for the next 100 years. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for this witness? Okay, I, I don't see any. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Oh, yeah, no problem. And then um, Jen Sherman Bach, she just, her whole email is about having MS and all this stuff that's coming out of the sky. This is the woman that was on the Geoengineering Study Commission with me. I also have MS. Um, I'll just paraphrase. She was astounded to find that all this stuff was coming out of the sky that exacerbates her, geo, her, um, her MS. And she was in the hospital yesterday dealing with treatments for this thing, and she missed the deadline on the... Um, but she's saying it's... She was horrified to learn that lead, aluminum, and other metals that produce neurological malfunction were deliberately being released in the inabsorbable forms upon the population and every other living being, and she never consented to this poisoning. I'm sure most rational people wouldn't either. And then she goes on how she saw all this, all this paper work that Rachel brought in, and she says Rhode Island must enact S-572. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I believe we should be joined by our next witness, um, Jolie Diane. Jolie, if you want to go ahead and introduce, um, introduce yourself to the committee, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, committee members. My name is Jolie Diane, founder and director of Zero Geoengineering in support of S0572. Thank you for taking the lead in Rhode Island on geoengineering regulation and governance to tackle hazardous emissions pollution. Uh, just in quick response to the question regarding current programs that would impact Rhode Island, I would like to reference two programs uh, for 2021, one international led by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and another being funded federally, uh, $200 million, without health or environmental regulation or oversight. Uh, it's imperative that this act protect against the threat of international corporate governance and prohibit weather certification uh, by way of cloud seeding or other methods of geoengineering. A very big problem with geoengineering is that research can be indistinguishable from operations with geoengineering origins and weather modification that began as environmental warfare. Another form of geoengineering known as carbon capture storage and utilization is not ecologically or biologically friendly. With environmental impacts such as acidification and human toxicity that are much higher with than without carbon capture storage and sequestration. Uh, as an independent geoengineering researcher and advocate for environmental and human health, I have frequently contracted laboratories for environmental water and snow sample analysis. The labs consistently find standard geoengineering agents, aluminum, barium, strontium, and sulfur dioxide. Dispersing megatons of atmospheric contaminants ultimately to Earth's surface and waters must be banned, else all biological life is threatened. S0572 regulates such activities and we are very grateful to Senators Kalman, Acosta, and DiMario for the introduction of the Geoengineering Hazardous Emissions Act. 
So in substantiation of the deliberate releases of solid aerosol pollution in the environment without consideration for bioeffects, I submit this link, solar geoengineering using solid aerosol in the stratosphere. Uh, geoengineering proponents acknowledge aluminum and sulfur aerosols and other contaminants and admit the human, animal, insect, and other damages caused thereby. Uh, notably, the U.S. banned sulfur dioxide and diesel fuel in 2010 because it causes asthma in children and produces acid rain. So EPA standards uh, banning sulfur dioxide remain intact to this day, and thus such release is illegal under federal law yet this continues in violation. So kindly review EPA's sulfur dioxide regulations submitted herewith. Federal law gives rise to Rhode Island strength in regulating as provided in S0572. Also see the National Academy of Sciences 2019 report, air pollution recognized as major source of mortality. Uh, federal and international efforts to fund geoengineering have suppressed the U.S. states from having input as to protecting their own human health and safety, natural resources, and economic well-being. But S0572 provides new opportunity and strength to reestablish state sovereignty in these matters. So with great gratitude to Senators Kalman, Acosta, DiMario, I urge you committee members to co-sponsor and pass 0572. Thank you very much. I'm happy any questions thank you so much are there any questions for this witness and senator valverde hi thank you um i wonder if you could could you give us any examples of kind of who is doing these uh releases that you're talking about sure absolutely um first that's that i just want to reference a um th there's hundreds of programs being funded uh, internationally, but one of them uh, is called Aerosol Study Over Northeast Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is atmospheric chemistry and physics. And then um, 2021, there's a solar geoengineering research and research governance move um, from the federal government, which I um, referenced. I believe that Rachel may have sent over the links to these programs. Um, also, um, at the federal level, we have NOAA. So a lot of these programs are happening federally and internationally with no regulation. And so they're collectively impacting um, all of the states. Uh, so those are a couple. And then it's notable that um, NOAA has uh, gotten awards and funding from the National Natural Science Foundation of China uh, through some grants, which I can also send to you. Uh, so, um, you know, there's different universities doing studies. For example, Sweden just rejected a study uh, that was uh, being pushed by Harvard and Bill Gates with stratospheric aerosol injection. Um, and that is now going to be moved to Arizona, I believe. Uh, but the problem is there's no regulation. And so this is why the Geoengineering Hazardous Emissions Act is a great step in the, in the right direction to start monitoring and figuring out who's doing what, because there are literally hundreds and hundreds of programs happening. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this witness? Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And I believe um, our next caller should be joining us, should be um, Sheila Restiger. And Sheila, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sheila Restiger, and I'm a resident of Cranston, Rhode Island. I'm testifying in strong support of S-572, the Geoengineering Hazardous Emissions Act. As a dog owner, I'm very conscious of what my pet inhales and ingests and how toxic what she absorbs can be. Please remember that terrestrial animals, whether pets, farm animals, or wild animals, walk on the ground where they pick up substances fallen from aerosol injection releases. They then clean themselves by licking their fur or feathers or paws, causing those toxic substances to be ingested. As they spend time outside, they also inhale these substances. By absorbing more toxics than humans per body size, animals are more vulnerable to toxic ge geoengineering releases. Aquatic animals are more vulnerable yet, swimming in and absorbing in their eyes, mouths, fins, and so on, contaminants dispersed in atmospheric injection programs. 
This may, r might render the seafood that many Rhode Islanders prize harmful when eaten. Already, fisheries are challenged. We need to maintain clean waterways and coasts free of geoengineering. Pollinators are at once most vulnerable, while most precious to us, but already suffering from intense chemical and physical agent pollutants in the atmosphere and waterways from geoengineering activities. We must save their lives before they become extinct for their own sakes and for the sake of our food supply. With S-572, we can achieve our state's right to freedom from exogenous impositions, whether federal or international, and reclaim the sovereignty over our land, water, air, and atmosphere. On behalf of all living beings, I urge each of you to co-sponsor and pass out of committee S-572. As an aside, uh, when I sent in my written testimony, I sent you a picture of my pet Chewini Trixie and her face looking out at the camera with her big eyes. She's counting on you. So please, please protect human health and our uh, animal, uh, the other, the animals that we live on this planet with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments for this witness? Okay, hearing none. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, you too. And we should be joined now by Angel Lopez. Angel, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Sure. Hi. Um, thank you for allowing me the moment to speak. My name is Angel Lopez. I'm from Providence, urging the passage of Senate Bill 0572. On June 27, 1972, Rhode Island's U.S. Congressman Claiborne Pell announced a plan for a worldwide ban on weather modification as a weapon of war. In Operation Popeye, the Ho Chi Minh Trail had been intentionally flooded during Vietnam. Agent Orange and other chemicals were released against farmers and their fields to attack crops. Like the Vietnamese, U.S. soldiers were also injured and killed by these geoengineering methods. Both here and there, people suffer ongoingly from these actions. Another instance was in the 1950s. The U.S. attacked Korean people, dropping chemical and biological agents, such as a crystalline form of mycoplasma that caused weakness in the limbs and inability to walk. Those are now known symptoms of multiple sclerosis, or MS. Toxic blowback again occurred against our own soldiers who were awarded compensation when they developed these symptoms. Today, our state has the opportunity with Senate Bill 0572 to lead the way to freedom from home attack by these activities. Here in Rhode Island, the skies here in our Rhode Island skies, toxic chemicals used for cloud seeding ultimately fall upon everything, including ourselves. We breathe them and become more susceptible to disease. They concentrate in the soil and water runoff, polluting our food sources, including our precious ocean. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, or NOAA, runs the Ocean Acidification Program, focused on monitoring the changes in ocean chemistry. But harmful geoengineering activities continue. We can impact the world like Congressman Pell did, taking responsibility for our atmosphere. This time, we will start right here, protecting all life in our state. Please vote to approve Senate Bill 572. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. Bye. And I believe we should be joined by uh, Wendy. Wendy, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, and okay. um, you can go ahead with your testimony. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, taking my testimony today. My name is Wendy Fashon, and I'm an environmental journalist and educator, and I am um, speaking in support of... Rhode Island Geoengineering and Hazardous Emissions Act of 2021, that's S572. Now, I'm worried about the sycamore trees down the street. They've not been looking well for the past couple of years. When all the other trees leafed out last spring, their branches remained bare. 
Eventually, their leaves did open. However, they were sparse. And usually the sycamores are shedding bark in early July, but not last summer. And just something just doesn't seem to be right with my old friend. In fact, tree, trees, trees are dying around the globe. And geoengineering, I think, is part of this, the cause of this. A decline in trees means that forests are less able to take up and store carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere. And that leads to a global warming feedback loop. Now, where geoengineering comes in is the intentional aerosol injection of acidic sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. It's done for the purpose of creating rain or dimming solar radiation, and yet acid rain has led to destruction of trees. And trees have naturally been managing those climates for millions of years. The intentional spraying of aluminum and barium particles, also part of geoengineering, and spraying these into the stratosphere is done for the purpose of deflecting solar radiation, and yet aluminum and barium nanodust are in Theory. They fuel the ferocity of super wildfires. And furthermore, aluminum inhibits plant growth and lowers plant nitrogen uptake, while barium inhibits the plant's ability to absorb and sequester carbon. Now, these are scientific facts. So this stuff is showering down into our soil and affecting trees, plants, crops, you name it. Um, when it comes to pure science, these are the natural they're natural absorbing carbon and cooling the planet and transferring water up in the air and mitigating climate change. And meanwhile, these costly, chemi costly chemically induced geoengineering, all this stuff is interfering with the trees' natural ability to do the vital work that they do. So that's all I want to say. Please, let's start regulating geoengineering for, the safe, for safety and efficacy to help save the trees and to assure our own survival. Thank you very much for listening to my testimony. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments for this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you very much. And, and we should be joined by uh, Jonathan. And Jonathan, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee, and you can go ahead with your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Thompson. I live in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I am a um, nuclear inspector for um, Hartford Steam Boiler, Connecticut, and I just want to say that I am in favor of uh, this bill, uh, the Geoengineering Act, and I'm sorry, but I didn't have, I'm kind of ill-prepared. I'm in the process of looking at a house right now, um, so I just want to say that I'm in favor of this bill. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. And we are getting our final witness uh, for the night on the phone right now. And while we are waiting to be connected, I do want to uh, make sure that the committee knows we did uh, receive a letter gen from Jennifer Sherman, which was referenced by a, a previous uh, witness in support of the legislation. We also have a... Um, a letter from Mark Jacobson, PhD, and he supports the legislation. We also have um, Dean Fashon, who is in support of the legislation. And um, we also have CTIA, who is in opposition to the legislation. Um, and with that, our final witness for the evening was Rima Tomka, and um, they did also submit written testimony in, um, in support of the legislation. However, they did not answer uh, the phone when we just tried them. So with that, um, there is uh, no further business before the committee tonight, and so I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Uh, moved by Senator DeMario, seconded by Senator Rogers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good night.